Okay, well, welcome um, to uh, Ask the Expert. Today we have Dr. Zorte Santin Gomez with us. She's coming from the Functional Genetics of Immune Disorders with the cute name Fun Immune. I love that. <laughs> At the University of Basque County, um, and it's a Bio Cruces, a Biscaya Research Institute. And she's going to be speaking to us regarding um, her talk, non-coding RNA-regulated networks in pancreatic B cells, their role in T1D development. And just a little bit about her. Um, she obtained her PhD in biology uh, from the University of Basque Country in 2009. And after a four-year postdoctoral um, position at ULB, Center for Diabetes Research in Brussels, she established the University of Basque County as associate professor in 2013. Her main research lines have been focused on the dissection of molecular mechanisms that lead to pancreatic beta cell dysfunction in type 1 diabetes. She studies the interaction between T1D susceptibility genes coding and non-coding and viral infections, playing special attention to the molecular mechanisms by which these inter interactions activate pro-inflammatory pathways in pancreatic beta cells. Welcome, Dr. Senton. Thank you so much for joining us. And I'm really excited to um, hear what you have to share with us. Uh, you gave us sneak peek earlier uh, off camera that um, you'll um, be sharing some published and not published work. So please take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much, Monica, for your kind introduction. And, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to present uh, our work in this uh, virtual space, which is always good for for setting up collaborations, for example. So as Monica said, uh, today I'm going to speak about uh, non-coding RNAs and about the role in, in pancreatic beta cells and specifically in type 1 diabetes de development. So um, first, uh, let me just make a brief introduction about the importance of the non-coding in, in genome. Because uh, during the last years, everybody has been focused on the coding genome. And in a way, we take into account, uh, a sec, we take into account the, the genome, the whole genome. We can see that the protein encoding um, RNA is just a very small amount, like two percent of the of the whole genome. Um, most of the genome then is non-coding uh, genome, and inside this group of non-coding RNAs, we have different kinds. Perhaps the most steered one is the short non-coding RNAs, for example, the microRNAs, which are implicated mainly in the transcriptional uh, regulation. And as you probably know, a lot of microRNAs have been associated with type 1 diabetes and other forms of diabetes also. And their function has been kind, kind of well uh, characterized. But uh, in our group, we are much more interested in uh, long encoding RNAs. So long encoding RNAs have been described as uh, RNA molecules that are greater than 200 nucleotides in length, and um, they do not translate uh, into protein. Okay, so um, in the last year, we have we have been focused on analyzing these long encoding RNAs. Uh, and to characterize their function in pancreatic beta, beta cells to check whether they have any kind of implication in the pathogenesis of, of the disease. So, um, long encoding RNAs in the last years have been really well studied, but there are a lot of long encodings still with unknown function. Um, they have been related mainly to transcriptional uh, regulation or better we can say that they have been linked to gene expression regulation. And uh, the way in which they regulate uh, this expression is different. They can regulate transcription, they can regulate translation, but they can also regulate other uh, mRNA activities, like for example, mRNA stability, and also mRNA localization in the different cell compartments. So they are linked to gene expression regulation through different uh, molecular uh, mechanisms. So once we have a brief introduction about lunar coding RNAs, let's talk just in one slide about the genetics of type 1 diabetes. We all know that this is a complex disease in which genetic and environmental factors interact. And um, during the last years, a lot of genome-wide association studies have been done, and a lot of different candidate genes have been associated 
to the genetic risk to develop uh, type 1 diabetes. So um, in these uh, uh, studies, um, normally when they find um, a, genomic, a genomic association signal, what they do is, which is the closest gene to this uh, association signal? And in this way, they decide that the candidate gene for type 1 diabetes is the first coding gene that is close to that signal. But very, low, very few attention uh, has been paid to these association signals that are outside coding regions. Um, so we can say somehow that we have been a little bit lost in translation. We have focused only uh, in characterizing the candidate genes that are coding, that code for that, they, that encode for a protein, but we haven't paid attention to this association signal that fall into non-coding regions. And um, in our lab, we think that these signals are also interesting and that also important for the development of type 1 diabetes. Um, indeed, uh, if we analyze all the disease-associated SNPs, not only for type 1 diabetes, but also for other complex diseases, we can see that very few proportions are located in coding regions or in promoters, and that more than the 90% of the SNPs-associated complex diseases are located in non-coding regions far away for, from, coding, from coding genes or also in introns, which um, nowadays we know that also can encode for small microRNAs, for example. So taking all, all this into account, we got very interested uh, in analyzing those low non-coding RNAs that harbor an SNP associated with type 1 diabetes. So this story starts some years ago, and um, we published one paper in PINAS in 2000, 2020, sorry, uh, in which we described the uh, function of a long coding RNA associated with type 1 diabetes in the, in the inflammation of pancreatic uh, beta cells. Um, why are important these SNPs in long coding RNAs? Because these SNPs, what good, what can do is to disrupt the secondary structure of these RNA molecules. The secondary structure of these long coding RNAs are super important for their function. So if we have one SNP that's, that disrupts its secondary structure, um, most probably it's going to have an impact also in its function. So as we can see here, we have long coding 13 with uh, one polymorphism that is associated with the genetic risk to develop type 1 diabetes and the two alleles. Here the C and here the T allele in this position. As you can see, the RNA molecule secondary structure is totally different. What we did in this uh, uh, work was to characterize the function of this long encoding RNA, taking into account which allele, uh, which allele the long encoding RNA had in this polymorphism associated with type 1 diabetes. And what we saw uh, was that um, depending on the allele present in the long encoding RNA, its effect was different in inflammation. When the long encoding RNA harbored the risk allele for type 1 diabetes, it was able to interact with PCBP2, uh, which is a protein that stabilizes mRNA in a more uh, in a stronger way than when it harbored the protective allele. And this interaction, what the, what was uh, doing was to stabilize the mRNA molecule of STAT1. And STAT1, you probably know a little bit about it because it's a transcription factor that is really implicated uh, in the regulation of inflammation and also in pancreatic beta cells. Indeed, um, pancreata of type 1 diabetic patients saw an upregulation of STAT1 and a regulation of STAT1 signal in pathway, which are totally related to chemokine production and inflammation. So um, in this uh, manuscript and in this work, we were, we were able to show that the risk allele in this long non-coding RNA created a much more inflammatory environment in pancreatic beta cells, and this would lead to increased insulitis and, of course, to type 1 development. So since then, uh, we have continued uh, characterizing other long non-coding RNAs, and um, 
Uh, this month, uh, we published this, this paper in which we um, characterized the, the function of ARGIN, a long non-coding RNA that harbors source on a SNP associated with type 1 diabetes. And we saw that this long non-coding RNA was also implicated uh, in the exacerbation of inflammation at the pancreatic beta cell level. So the first thing uh, we did uh, in this work was first to identify long non-coding RNAs that harbor one SNP associated with type 1 diabetes. So to this aim, we intersect the genomic locations of all type 1D associated SNPs present in the EWOS catalog with the genomic locations of all human long non-coding RNAs annotated in non code at that moment. And we found that uh, 69 long non-coding RNAs harbored at this one SNP associated with type 1 diabetes. We were interested on the effect of these SNPs. And since the effect of the SNP is mainly when they are located in exonic regions, at the end, we selected only those long non-coding RNAs that had an uh, exonic SNP associated with type 1 diabetes. Can I, and um, the, just, can I just interject one second? We just yeah. have a question in the chat. Are the results, yeah. um, she's asking, are the results derived from well-established T1D research? And I think that's pertaining to the previous slide. What is Not your paper, one? but the one, one back. I'm coming back. This one, long ago, 13 data. I think mean, so, yeah. What do you mean with well-established type 1 diabetes research? Yeah, I'm not sure. Do <laughs> I don't really get the question. I don't either. Can you unmute yourself, Kari? Yeah, I think I, I got the point she mentioned already. Yeah, it's from T1D. I meant T1D patients itself, well-established T1D patient, I mean, right. Great. Where the okay. result from uh, T1D patients itself or it's from before T1D development because you had mentioned the viral infection itself uh, leading to LNC13. So, yeah, so uh, I think I got the question. Would you yeah. mean if, if this uh, start one up regulation have been shown in Taiwan diabetic patients? Yeah, or before development of the disease itself. Okay, so uh, yes, start one up regulation have been shown in the pancreata of Taiwan diabetic patients, for example, in studies like Emport, in which they have checked uh, those pancreata coming for Taiwan diabetic uh, donors, um, and there is still resi residual um, beta cell. And in this pancreata, they have shown an increase of STAT1 and also an increase of other um, antiviral genes. Uh, that may be implicated in in um, in inflammation in insulitis. Yeah. Great. Thanks for doing that. <clears throat> okay. So back to where we were. Yeah. So to the recent work, I was talking about how we found this long encoding RNAs um, harboring and SNP. So we focus mainly in those that were present in an exon in this long encoding RNAs because we are interested in those affecting the secondary structure of the RNA molecule. And we came to 10 long encoding RNAs. Of course, we didn't know if these long encoding RNAs were um, uh, expressed or not in pancreatic beta cells. So we normally use a model that perhaps is not the best, but it's an in vitro model uh, of a pancreatic, a human pancreatic beta cell line called endocyd one So we took these uh, cells and we um, transfected them with the synthetic double-stranded, um, viral double-stranded RNA called uh, PIC. And uh, here you can see what happened with the expression of this long encoding RNA that we found in the previous step. So as you can see here, some of them, the one with the stars, were upregulated after intracellular PIC exposure. Meaning that probably when a, when a, a pancreatic beta cell um, suffers a viral infection, there is an increase of this long encoding RNAs. And this data was also uh, confirmed using um, Coxsackie virus because it's, um, let's say, biologically more relevant. So through a collaboration with our colleagues from the ULB in, in Belgium, we did some experiments with Coxsackie virus in, in two um, different um, models. 
again in the endo CPH1 and also in IPS uh, derived uh, beta cells. And as you can see here, uh, with the B1 serotype, there was an increase in Rg expression here. And also uh, in endo CBH1 cells, there was an evolution. There was a kind of trend with the B4 serotype, but it was not uh, significant. So we got very interested in Rg because uh, first it was upregulated uh, by viral infections because it harbor and SNP associated with type 1 diabetes. And because um, there was a previous paper uh, that was published more than 10 years ago in Nature that described that this polymorphism that at that time was supposed to be intergenic, the genotype of this SNP correlated with differential expression of an antiviral expression network in immune cells. Um, this um, antiviral expression network was called IDIM, and this um, network uh, was enriched with Taiwan diabetes uh, candidate genes. So for us, it was really, really uh, interesting. We found that this SNP that was correlated with the expression of this antiviral network was located in a slow non coding RNAs. So taking into account that most probably viral infections are having an effect in Taiwan D pathogenesis by infecting pancreatic beta cells, our, our uh, question was, okay, let's see what happened with non oncoding RG in pancreatic beta cells upon exposure to a viral infection. And let's see if this non oncoding RNA is regulating also this antiviral network at the pancreatic beta cell uh, level. So, um, the first step normally to characterize a long encoding RNA is to check um, its localization. So we first um, we, we perform some RNA extractions for cellular fraction of endoc cells exposed to intracellular uh, peak, and we observed that it was uh, totally nuclear. Okay, Meg is a nuclear uh, marker, uh, RPLPO is a cytoplasmic marker, and in this case, Argi was preferentially expressed in the nuclei, and it was uh, regulated upon a uh, viral infection. So this data um, give us some evidence about the potential function of this long encoding RNA, I said it before, the location is very important. Normally, long encoding RNAs um, located in the nuclei are uh, implicated in transcriptional regulation. So in order to check whether this long encoding RNA was somehow regulating the expression of genes from the eating network or genes related to the antiviral response, we perform an uh, RNA sequencing in endocybh one cells um, upregulated uh, with ARG, uh, cells that were over expressing uh, ARG, as we can see here. One and, quick question again. Um, yeah. Did you investigate? Did you also investigate the function of SNC RNAs to viral infection and type one diabetes? No, not not yet. It's something that we have in mind, but we haven't uh, checked it yet. No. To be determined. Yeah, to, yeah, that's it, to be determined. So mm, the results of our rna -SEC, um were uh, interesting because um, when we did the gene ontology enrichment analysis of those differentially upregulated genes, we observed that these upregulated genes were enriched in some pathways that were related indeed with antiviral uh, response, like uh, cellular response to Taiwan interference, Taiwan interference signaling, uh, defense response to virus. Um, and, more, and moreover, um, among the 70,000 transcripts that we detected, 430 were members of the ID, ID uh, network, 4.32% uh, of the significantly upregulated genes were also members of the ID network. So we got very excited about this and um, we started asking what is this long encoding RNA doing in, in pancreatic beta cells? Probably you have seen this scheme in other papers. Um, but the thing is that all these upregulated genes, most of them were IGCs, interferon stimulated genes. And these uh, genes, as the name say, they are upregulated by type 1 interferons that are produced upon a viral infection in pancreatic beta cells and that by an autocrine loop 
can activate the, this expression, okay, of these uh, interferon stimulated genes. And we observed that also in pancreatic beta cells, when ARGI was upregulated, interferon beta was also upregulated. So that means that interferon beta when, went up, and this could somehow affect the expression of all these genes regulated by interferons that we observe in our uh, rna -SEC. So we decided to check whether uh, this ARGI was really regulated interferon beta trans transcription, uh, and also to check whether it was regulating other uh, IGSTs. So we um, perform an experiment called CRISPR-I, uh, CRISPR inhibition, in which using uh, one guide and one inactivated caspase, uh, Cas9, sorry, um, fused to a transcriptional repressor, we can repress the expression of ARGI in pancreatic beta cells. And um, we could um, inhibit the expression quite nicely um, using this technique, both in basal and also in peak transfected beta cells, and we can see here. And mainly uh, when the cell was transfected with PIC and the expression of ARGI was unregulated using this approach, we could see a, redux a reduction in interferon beta expression and also in a very well-known interferon um, stimulated gene called ISC15, as we can see here. So uh, we could confirm that somehow ARGI was implicated in the transcriptional regulation of these genes that are implicated in Taiwan interferon uh, pathway. So our second question was, okay, is ARGI binding to the regulatory regions of these genes in the chromatin? Um, so to, to check this, we did an RNA and disease purification. It's not a simple a simple procedure mainly when we are working with pancreatic beta cells that um, do not duplicate, duplicate very well and we need a huge amount of cells to this but basically what we do is to to cross link the cells to block the interactions between different macromolecules and then we analyze um fragments of the chromatin bound to our RNA of interest, in this case, to argin. So we do, do, do this by QPCR. We design some primers um, binding or, or hybridizing with um, the regulatory regions of interferon beta and ISD15. And um, here uh, we have um, the results. So we could, um, we could um, uh, purified or captured ARGI quite nicely, both in basal condition and after peak transfection, as we can see here in the white bars, the gray bars are the negative control. And we could observe that ARGI, when peak was introduced into the cells, was bound to the ISD15 promoter, was bound to the ISD15 enhancer, and was also bound to the interferon beta uh, promoter. So this means that when the cells um, has a viral infection, ARGI is going to bind uh, to these regulatory regions of these genes that are implicated in antiviral response. But ARGI by itself probably is not regulating, transcri is not regulating transcription. So we check which transcription factors were binding to these regions. And as you can see here, we have the typical ones that are related to inflammation and antiviral responses like IRF7, STAT1, and so on. We did some RNA immunoprecipitations to check whether these proteins were bound to ARGI or not, and we didn't see any, any binding. But then we focused our attention in another transcription factor called CTCR. This is a very special transcription factor because it's multifunctional. It can repress or it can activate transcription, depending on the cell type, depending on the stimuli, depending on the position or localization. So it was quite difficult to, to understand its function, but we, we did an RNA immunoprecipitation to check whether ARGI was uh, binding to CTCR. So we did immunoprecipitation again in basal pancreatic beta cells and also in cells transfected with this uh, viral double strand in RNA. And we observed that under peak transfection, ARGI was actually binding to CTCR. So the second question was, okay, and um, are this, is this complex binding to ISC15 regulatory regions and to interferon beta regulatory regions? And we did again, 
um, a wrap, but in this case, purifying not only chromatin, but also RNA. And we observed that, yes, it was true, CTCR was binding to uh, ARGI, that I forgot to put it, the, the graph here, but believe me, that was binding to, to ARGI. And simultaneously, it was binding to ISC 15 promoter, ISC 15 enhancer, and also to interferon beta promoter. So that means that ARGI was binding CTCR to bind to these regulatory regions and to increase the expression of these antiviral and pro-inflammatory genes in pancreatic beta cells upon exposure to a viral infection. But I would like to come back to the fact that this long encoding RNA is associated with Taiwan development and that we have an SNP that, as you can see here, disrupts its secondary structure. So we wanted to know what was the impact of this SNP in this long encoding RNA and in all this process? So we um, perform a RIP again in cells in which ARGI with the protective allele for type 1 diabetes was overexpressed and in pancreatic beta cells in which ARGI with the risk allele was overexpressed. And as we can see here, when uh, ARGI harbors the risk allele, it's much more bound to CTCF. That means that the risk allele in this long encoding somehow um, leads to a, be a stronger um, contact with CTCF, and probably this leads to an um, increased transcription of the genes that we have uh, commented before. Indeed, when we have regulates argue with the protective of the risk allele in pancreatic beta cells using just um, an overexpression vector, we could see that the expression of, of both allele is similar, is similar, but uh, we have an increased expression of interferon beta or, I, or IFC15 of a STAT1. So that means that the risk allele in this long encoding RNA increases or exacerbates the expression of some pro-inflammatory genes. Okay. So just yes, as a conclusion, we know that viral infections in pancreatic beta cells increase ARGI expression. When ARGI has the protective allele for type 1 diabetes, there is an increase of antiviral uh, genes, ISGs, but this antiviral response, let's say, is kept in homeostasis. However, when ARGI has the risk allele, all this process is exacerbated. There is an hyperactivation of the antiviral response that can lead to inflammation, to insulitis, and eventually to Taiwan D uh, development. So um, until very few years ago, known coding RNAs were junk uh, DNA, but now in, well, nowadays we know, at least for type 1 diabetes, that in pancreatic beta cell, they play kind of important role in regulation of inflammation and also in the regulation of, of apoptosis. So this junk DNA is not so useless uh, after all. So in the last... Three, three slides. Um, I want to, to present you some unpublished data. Until here, everything is published, so you can find it in the, in the manuscript. But uh, I want to break the paradigm uh, and explain you what happens when these non-coding molecules become coding. Because up to now, protein coding genes were defined as genes having one open reading frame of around 300 nucleotides going from a canonical start codon to a stop codon. Okay, but some recent findings um, uh, have, have seen that or have explained that um, some assumed non coding regions are also able to encode small peptides. For example, some small peptides can be um, encoded from long encoding RNAs. Some small peptides can be encoded from five five prime UGR uh, regions. So, and also protein translation can stand in non canonical star codons, mainly in cells that are suffering an, an stress like a, a viral infection. So, at the beginning, I said, I said long encoding RNAs are RNA molecules that do not translate into protein, but uh, I have to admit that it was not uh, actually true because, or at least it's not the whole truth because now we know that some non encoding RNAs encode some small proteins. And these small proteins called micropeptides um, 
are functional in many cases and have been shown to participate uh, in autoimmune inflammation, in cellular homeostasis in pancreatic beta cells. So it seems that these micropeptides uh, are a novel field of study in the research of different uh, uh, diseases. So we did a ribosec um, to check long encoding RNAs that are bound to the uh, ribosome when um, the cells, the pancreatic beta cells, are exposed to, to a viral infection. And we found that one long encoding RNA was uh, upregulated. And interestingly, this uh, long encoding RNA, that this is not the name, okay, the name is not this, it's just um, invented. This long encoding RNA has a Taiwan D associated SNP. Okay, so uh, we took this long encoding RNA sequence and using some prediction software, CPV2 and CPAT, we saw that it has an open reading frame that encodes for a, a small peptide uh, of 100, um, 100 amino acids. We use different uh, programs to check for the um, coding potential of this open reading frame and all the data available let us think that probably this open reading frame is encoding a micropeptide. So the first thing we did was to check whether actually this open reading frame was encoding one micropeptide. And to this end, we clone the full length long encoding RNA in an in a, a expression vector uh, with some modifications. We took the open reading frame and just before the, the stop codon, we put a flag tag in order to, to be able to detect it by Wester blot. And the uh, Wester blot show that indeed this open reading frame was uh, encoding one small micropeptide here. Okay, this is the negative control, this is the positive control, and here we have another, another candidate. Uh, so we we get we got very excited because we found one well non-coding RNA upregulated by viral infections that have um, a polymorphism associated with diabetes and that has an open reading frame that encodes, encodes a, mi a micropeptide. So we bought a customized antibody uh, to check whether um, cells were producing this this micropeptide. So we took uh, pancreatic beta cells exposed uh, to peak, and we checked for, for the expression of this ma micropeptide. And surprisingly, as you can see here in this figure, and these are very, very preliminary, uh, preliminary results, we have the micropeptide um, stain in green, the DAP in blue, and also cleavage cash pastry. And as you can see here, those pancreatic beta cells that are apoptotic are expressing our micropeptide. So it seems that this micropeptide is highly expressed in apoptotic beta cells. We don't know yet if it's provoking apoptosis or is the cause of the apoptosis. So we need to, be, to do much more experiments, but we think that this uh, project is going to um, result in very, very nice data. So this is it. I hope you, you like the presentation and also the, the data that we presented. I'm open to, to listen to your questions also in the future. If you want any collaboration, please just write to us or find us in, in Twitter. And I have to thank also to the members of my groups that are doing the, the greatest part of all this work. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was really interesting, particularly the last uh, bit is, is very exciting. I wondered, you know, um, how difficult is it to detect these micropeptides um, in human patients? You know, just thinking about as those um, individuals are very close to progressing to type one diabetes, maybe undergoing apoptosis, would it be um, possible to detect micropeptides in their blood? And obviously it's, it's so localized but yeah. I'm just curious if there's any other disease states where micropeptides um, are detected in context of, you know, either viral, you know, insult yeah. or, or, you know, apoptotic events. So here we have two hypotheses. The first hypothesis is that these micropeptides are uh, asserting the function in, in pancreatic beta cells. 
and um, I don't know, they activate apoptosis or they participate in other, in other pathways at the pancreatic beta cell level, okay? Yeah. Our second hypothesis is that perhaps after, for example, for this micropeptide, we see that it's overexpressing apoptotic cells. So this is going to somehow be released to the medium. And we think that perhaps it's going to be, it, it can play a role as a new neoepitope. Um, that it perhaps can be recognized by T cells or by AP APCs and, uh, to increase the autoimmune attack. But I'm not sure how easy it can be to, to detect them uh, in blood or in serum. This is something that, that we don't know yet. We have some, some sample from Taiwan diabetic patients. So we first want to, to really check that the peptide is being released to the media. And if this is true, we will check in, in serum from patients whether this uh, peptide is there or not using one uh, customized ELISA. And uh, we would like also, we, we have uh, just asked to the airport network for some uh, pancreatic tissue, also using this customized antibody to check whether we can detect the micropeptide in, in Taiwan diabetic patients. Mm. Yeah, no, that seems really interesting. And I'm sure, you know, Enodia is um, accruing samples as well, you know, as they, um, you know, gain more um, traction in Europe. So there's, that's, um, I guess, another opportunity there. So this is, you know, when you're, when you're, the next steps for you are, you um, you know, to kind of see how this micropeptide, you know, it's, it's functionality, what is it actually doing? And mm -hmm. so when we're talking, when you're talking about its interface with the immune system, I guess if you, I don't know if you want to speculate about what it might, you know, how it could inform the immune system, um, you know, in a program. Yeah. So we are not um, really experts um, in immunology of type 1 diabetes. We have been always focused on pancreatic beta cell itself. So we need to study some collaborations to check whether, for example, this micropeptide is processed in beta cells, and then some small epitopes are presented by HLA molecules to T cells and see if there is an interaction there. Another a possibility is that the micropeptide, the whole micropeptide is released and the APCs recognize it and process it. And again, the APCs are showing some epitopes to, to T cells. So to do this kind of, um, let's say, immunologic, immunological studies like tetramer assays and this kind of stuff, we need to establish some collaborations because we don't know the techniques. So this is our next steps uh, are, are in line with this, to establish some collaborations to see how this, mic this micropeptide can activate the autoimmune response by uh, activating T cells and macrophages, for example. Yeah, no, that's very interesting. I mean, and there's so many people there. I mean, at actually at ULB, Desio yeah. and, you know, even Roberto Malone and David Klatsman, mm -hmm. Sorbonne, there's so many people in Europe who are doing some very interesting work that might be great collaborators. Um, from um, Boston, Kiati is asking, Gerdar is asking any relation with beta cell senescence. We don't know really. As, as I said before, uh, we have very preliminary, preliminary data, so we still don't know what the micropeptide is doing, and we haven't checked for senescence. Peter, Tom, I hope in the in the next months we will probably have more data, and perhaps we can do another another presentation, um, telling you it's the real function of this micropeptide. Fantastic, yeah. Peter Thompson, very interested in the senescent. Um, functionality of the beta cell up in he's up in Canada. Um, okay, so um, we're a little bit past our hour. Thank you so much. We're very much looking forward to uh, featuring and promoting your uh, new paper in our upcoming Friday Week in Review or WEIR newsletter, and that would be uh, the Advanced Sciences September 10th, 2023 paper long non-coding RNA R RG contributes to virus-induced pancreatic B-cell inflammation through transcriptional activation of IFN-stimulated genes. So 
anyone listening to this, be on the lookout this Friday. You can take a peek. Um, and if you have any other questions, please reach out to Azorta Santin directly. Thank you again and have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye.